Hello, thank you all for coming today. I'd like to start off asking your goodness in any way and the error fall short of your expectations. Um, it is, however, my hope that the, the gathering here might be a fruitful time for us uh, to develop a further understanding of the riches which our church has to offer through a divine theology and that this might spark some discussion amongst us. Last week's talk covered one of the major building blocks of our church's theology. This was in the form of the Trinity. This week, likewise, takes on a big topic, namely Christology. But this talk looks to point to the very practical application of Christology as it's found in icons. The way in which this will be demonstrated is through looking at Christology itself, as set up by Cyril of Alexandria in his work on the unity of Christ, and moving from this work through the Council of Chalcedon to a word about how this relates to iconography. In our talk last week, we briefly noted Christ to be fully God and fully human, sharing fully in divinity as found in the Trinity, partaking fully in our humanity. The question that was not directly addressed last week was the question of how the God was beyond being and completely uncircumscribable, or more literally, unable to be drawn around, is incarnate. This will be the focus of what we discuss here today. Cyril of Alexandria lived from the year 376 to 444. During this time frame, Cyril was the Patriarch of Alexandria from 412 until 444. The particular work that we will be looking at today is Cyril's On the Unity of Christ. Again, the title is telling, just as was the case last week with Not Three Gods by Gregory of Nyssa. The opponents were those who claimed three gods within the Christian cosmology. Here, for Cyril, one can clearly see that the opponents are a faction that were claiming Christ lacked a unity. It is from Cyril's acquittal of Christ's unity that we shall then move move on to how this facilitates iconography. Before launching straight into Cyril, however, I'd like to point out what exactly Christology is. In many ways, Christology is a hermeneutic, that is to say, a lens of interpretation. Some examples of this can be found in our very own Gospel, where Matthew presents a wisdom Christology, Mark presents a messianic Christology, Luke Acts, one of spirit, Romans, one of the new Adam, and John presents what becomes the dominant way of thinking about Christ, a Logos Christology, within which Christ is the cosmic intelligence. One needn't, however, choose from these options, as it seems to me the best approach is seeing in numbers. Much of Christology was settled at the ecumenical councils. So a quick word on the councils before returning to Cyril. Moving historically, one finds that the what Christ was settled fairly early on. The first ecumenical council at Nicaea, which was held in 325, rooted Arianism and came up with the forerunner to the, the version of Crete which we recite today in church. The Nicene Crete declares that when it comes to Christ, we believe in one Lord, the Son of God, only begotten of the Father, that is, of the same essence as the Father, God from true God, light of light, begotten, not made, one essence with the Father. This very clearly states that Jesus is God, addressing the what of Christ. It does not, however, address the how of Christ's existence as both man and God. The hell of Christ's existence is hashed out at Chalcedon, held in the year 451, where it is stated, So, following the saintly fathers, we all with one voice teach the confession of one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity, the same truly God and truly man, of rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father as regards his divinity, 
and the same constantial with us as regards his humanity. Like us in all respects except for sin, begotten before the ages from the Father as regards his divinity. And in the last days, the same for us and for our salvation from Mary, the Virgin, God-bearer, as regards his humanity. One and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, acknowledged in two natures which undergo no confusion, no change, no division, no separation. At no point was the difference between the natures taken away through the union, but rather the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single person and a single subsistent being. He is not parted or divided into two persons, but is one and the same only begotten Son, God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ. Just as the prophets taught from the beginning about him, and as the Lord Jesus Christ himself instructed us, and the creeds of the fathers handed it down to us. So the question of what is Christ is addressed here. The council clearly states that there is one and same Son who is Lord, existing in perfect divinity and humanity. These two natures undergo no confusion, change, division or separation. And in point of fact, the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single person, what is called subsistent being. Cyril, however, was writing before this council. So let us turn to Cyril himself before turning him into Chalcedonian prematurely. To give you all some background, Cyril wrote on the unity of Christ as the result of a disagreement he had with Nestorius the then Patriarch of Constantinople, concerning the question of whether a person must correspond to a nature. More specifically, does there have to be both a human and divine son in the form of Jesus if he has both divine and human natures? Nestorius tended towards duality, while Cyril tended towards unity. This is to say that for Nestorius, each nature demanded hypostasis, that is, person. While Cyril was proposing, as we understood it, one person with two natures. Yet this begs the question, how can one subject be both of one essence, homo usius, with both humanity and divinity? Those of you who were here for the last talk will well remember the way in which God is beyond all of our circumscription. This is true both spatially and logically. Accordingly, the question starts to emerge, how can the divine nature, which is beyond all comprehension, be confined in the flesh? One sees an inverse use of terms emerge for Christology as it was for the Trinity. Just as in the Trinity, we saw one nature in three persons, that is to say, divinity exists fully and equally in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Christology, two natures subsist in one person, that is, the divine and the human natures exist in the nature of Christ, in the person of Christ. As a side note, for Cyril and Chalcedon, Thesis was the term used for nature, However, after this point, usia became the dominant word for essence. The way in which one comes to fathom the divine, which is uncircumscribable, existing in the world, is through what Cyril calls a hypostatic union, that is an hypothetiki emosis. This is a union found in the person of Christ, wherein he, as a single individual, exists from two natures, both human and divine. The union facilitates the, very, the communication of idioms, a very important notion for retaining God's impassibility, that is, a pathum in Greek. This means that the communication of idioms allows God not to undergo pain, while, at the same time, allowing one to speak about the person of Christ, the 
the passion of Christ in the person of Jesus, or his being moved to compassion on those whom he healed. Both of these acts, however, specifically take place in the person of Jesus. The communication of idioms roots Christ's actions in his nature. When taking into consideration the person of Christ, whom Cyril tells us is a unity, his, huma, his human and divine attributes and experiences might properly be referred to each of his natures, so that one may speak of the suffering of God without causing God the Father to suffer. So while suffering might be attributable to the human nature, walking on water is attributable to the divine nature. Indeed, one is able to go through and divide up many of the accounts in the Gospels according to the categories of both high and low Christologies. This is a Kenosis Theseus and Kenosis Theseus. And this is all based on which nature is acting. Yet, even though there are two natures in Christ, there remains only one agent, namely the person of Christ. Perhaps a visual would make this easy. Here, one sees on the top of subjects. And on the bottom row, we have neighbors. Cyril tells us that there are two natures, but one subject. What we see is there is one divine nature and one human nature. But they come together in subject, which is Christ. One thing about nature that is worth bearing in mind is that nature comes complete with both the will and function. Accordingly, in the person of Jesus, there were two wills, one divine and one human. And the two types of actions, there were also the two types of action, but there remained only one actor. There was not conflict between these two natures, as Christ fully subordinated his humanity to the divine will, standing as an icon of perfect humanity for us. There are, however, some variations on this doctrine that occurred in the early church. If we return to the board, one sees the Nestorian temptation is quite clear. The temptation is to have a nature with a corresponding hypostasis of person. Thus emerges what is known as the two sons theory. Yet one cannot accept two sons if there is a unity in Christ. The Nestorian position, or at least the position of those who followed Nestorius, is that Jesus Christ is not identical with the Son, but personally united with the Son, who lives in him as one hypostasis, as one nature, human. This is a position held to this day by the Nestorian Church, or Church of the East. Nestorianism seeks to discern the difference between Christ's divinity and humanity in an attempt to protect the Godhead from being brought down to earth. This is to say that impassibility, or God's inability to suffer, was their primary concern. One can, however, go too far in the opposite direction. This is to say that one does not distinguish enough between the two natures, Christ, leading one to declare that Christ has only one nature. There are two ways in which one can assert Christ to have only one nature. After the union of divine and human, in the incarnation of Christ, there remained only a single nature, which was either entirely divine, or a synthesis of divine and human natures, creating a third thing. Tichis proposed a doctrine in response to Nestorianism, wherein the divine nature swallows the human nature, creating this new third nature, which is neither fully divine nor fully human. This notion was condemned a short 20 years after, it, after he proposed it at the First Council of Ephesus in 451. 
and it never became a dominant theological strand. Neapolitism, on the other hand, has become a dominant strand in theological thought, which refers to the non-Chalcedonian churches. This covers Coptic and Syrian churches. This strand found themselves to be sticking true to Cyril by rejecting the Council of Chalcedon. Cyril declares Christ to be mia thesis to theu logo se sarcum men, that is, one, mia, nature of the word of God incarnate. In an attempt to make, remain faithful to this high Christology, the divine nature of Christ is stressed to such an extent that it becomes the only nature of Christ. Both the teachings of Ephtichis and that of the Miaphysite Zishan fall under the umbrella of Monophysite Christology. While there is no sympathy for Ephtichis, there are many who find there to be something about the non-Chalcedonian, Coptic and Syrian position that expresses something true. John Mendorf advances the notion that the official teaching of Eastern, the Eastern Orthodox Church is not expressed by Chalcedon alone, but Chalcedon plus Syria. For this reason, the non-Chalcedonian churches in some of the closest dialogue partners of the Orthodox Church today. So if we look once more to the board, one will find the Orthodox position is between the Nestorian position of two persons for two natures. So in that case, this box would have human nature or a human person also to correspond to the human nature. The monophysite notion of one nature for one person is the converse of this, where you would simply have a divine subject and a divine nature covering human nature. One might even go so far as to say that the orthodox position is a happy medium between too much determination, which leads to two persons, as is found in the Nestorian camp, and too little discrimination between the natures, which is found in the Miyapas position. Cyril relates the two natures in a manner which the orthodox would uphold when he notes that, quote, the force of any comparison falters here and fall short of truth, although I can bring to mind a feeble image of this reality, namely that of hypostatic human, which might lead us to something tangible, as it were, to the very heights and to what is beyond all speech. It is like iron or any other such material, when it is put in contact with a raging fire, it receives the fire into itself, and when it is in the heart of the fire, if someone should beat it, then the material itself takes the battery, but the nature of the fire is in no way injured by the one who strikes it. This is to say that the two natures here, that of fire and iron, exist together, while remaining both fire and iron. Yet it is possible to affect the iron without affecting the fire. This, too, may be stated for the hypostatic union, which consists of two natures. In this union, Christ's human nature is able to suck without the divine nature being affected, imitating the iron and the fire. Yet this talk promised to say something about icons, and this is exactly what we shall turn to now. What you have followed up to this point is the difficult part, the rest of what I'm going to say is going to slot into the categories that we've already set up. When dialoguing with various Christian denominations, one of the first things the Orthodox are asked about is the role of icons in their worship. A rebuttal that is often met is that of, haven't you heard the commandment? Thou shalt not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or on earth below. The answer being, of course, but one must put this in its proper context. The question of icons was addressed in the 8th century, where their legitimacy was questioned, 
But the answer, as the Euler Studite demonstrated, came down to simple Christology. Last week, a big deal was made about God's existence as a perigrapus, that is, uncircumscribable, or, more literally, not able to be drawn around. The question that one ought to ask with icons, however, is not whether God's essence is uncircumscribable, but whether the hypostasis, that is, the person of Christ, is able to be circumscribed or drawn around. If yes, then one may depict Christ in icons. I think, through a discussion of the hypostatic union, it has been demonstrated that divinity was united with humanity and became visible in the person of Christ. So this should not be too much of a question at this point. Yet one must keep iconography strictly to that which has become manifest. One can depict Christ, one can depict the spirit as a love or a fiery tongue, but one cannot depict the Father. One other thing that cannot be depicted is Christ cannot be depicted as a lamb. As this is how Christ appeared only to the Apostle and Evangelist John in his apocalyptic vision. But since Christ did not manifest himself this way on earth, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, that is, Third Constantinople, forbade depicting Christ as a lamb. Thus, when it comes to icons, one is depicting divinity as it is manifested in humanity. This is true of the person of Christ, who is God incarnate, but also true of saints. The depiction of a saint in an icon is always their heavenly and deified form. Thus, one sees in icons of the saints a manifestation of the working of the Holy Spirit. And this is done in and through the saint. Thus, the veneration of the icon is the veneration of the divinity born by the one depicted. But the depiction is of the individual that bore the divinity. Thus, God has manifested himself in a circumscribable form. Unlike God the Father, we are now allowed to depict Christ and the saints in the same way Solomon adorned his temple. This is described in 1 Kings 6.29, where it states that, quote, on the walls all around the temple, in both the inner and outer rooms, he carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Before closing, I'd like to point out one other way in which we can use this box on the board. This box can also be used to depict what happens at the time of Holy Communion. For commu in communion, one finds the nature of divinity and the nature of the elements on the bottom. This humanity with the elements of the bread and wine. There is then a hypostatic union between divinity and the bread and the wine. Instead of being the single person of Christ, they become the single unit, the, the Eucharist. This results in the presence of the Eucharist as a hypostasis, which is made up of both divinity and the bread and wine as the elements. This differs from something such as the Catholic notion of transubstantiation, within which the elements over here become divine and they cease to be the elements or purely the body and blood of Christ, because this actually leads to a form of Eucharistic miaphatism. So this concludes what I've prepared for today. Um, the main takeaway here is that humanity and divinity stood together in the person of Christ, and that this person, insofar as he can be circumscribed, provides the ground for icons.